जय बाबा कोई चारा न रहा तेरी यादों के सिवाय कोई सहारा न रहा तेरे चरणों के सिवाय No no alternative left left except to keep on remembering you. No, any place of security left except to notice you. The world has come to that stage too. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Most beautiful words by the poet. Chala. Let us begin as usual with the most beautiful words of Jalaluddin Rumi, so that uh, before we begin the talk, we all are in the right perspective. Hello, Nazdeek, are you in the back? Oh, you're good. To know. I was hoping that you would be my cheerleader. <laughs> so, Jalaluddin Rumi, who made a bad one? Jalaluddin Rumi has declared. that it is only till such time that ignorance prevails that one has recourse to words when true knowledge dawns there is total silence it is because of our ignorance that we have this thirst for words otherwise it has no meaning absolutely no meaning and jalaluddin rumi will illustrate this point with a very beautiful short story a small village covered over by very very high walls very steep and hard walls very difficult to climb But once in a while, some inhabitant in that village would make a, a decision or have the audacity to climb the wall and try and see what is behind the other side of the wall. A few of them did succeed to climb the wall and go to the other side. But none of them ever came back. Many years passed by, and one day another young chap stood up and said, "I'll climb the wall and see what is on the other side." And the villagers said, "We have lost too many youngsters like that." You climb this wall on one condition: we tie a rope round your waist, and then we pull you down if you don't come down. And tell us what you have seen. Some or other, he managed to climb the wall. Whatever he saw, no one knows. He, they told him, "What? Tell us what you are seeing." That he never answered. So they pulled him down, and they asked him, "What did you see on the other side?" From that day, that man never spoke because he had seen the truth. And no one can understand truth unless it becomes one with it. That is the beauty of it. Swami Vivekananda once mentioned that this world is a place where we come to learn things. And at present, what we are doing is that uh, school, colleges, edu- education institutes give us education, not denying it. And some of them are very good at education institutes and education as well. Thanks to this advancement in math. Now they are in a city like that. <coughs> that reminds me of the joke in Pakistan. Swami Vivekananda once said that this world is a place where we come to study, to learn things over here. Unfortunately, all the education that we acquire over here is nothing else but a breath taker to earn our livelihood and things like that. But there is something else which has to be learned also, and that knowledge is of the divine. And once he has acquired that knowledge, for that man, everything else is open book. Once beloved Baba told Heeraj, "What do you mean by infinite knowledge?" And Heeraj said, "I do not know." And beloved Baba gave the most beautiful explanation: "To know nothing means you have infinite knowledge." And Heeraj asked for a clarification: "How come? When you have become infinite, what does that mean? It means that I have become the table also. Since I have become the table, I have no need to study about the table. I am that finished." The moment you say that you know, you know nothing means that you are that, and that is why you do not have to study. 
but for the likes of us, we have to learn. And uh, whatever little I gather from the Sukhi literature, there are certain principles that they have given to us. begin with Prophet Muhammad. During the time of Omar, the second caliph of the Islamic world, there was a musician who was very renowned for his voice and the command on the sitar, an oriental musical instrument. And so beautiful and wonderful was his playing and his voice that he was naturally invited to the houses of the rich and the aristocrat, the darbar of the influential people. And uh, he was earning money hand over fist, enjoying life and all that. Very happy, very successful man. Time passed by and he became an old man. And now his voice began to crack. His hands would not move that fast on that instrument sitar, which was once absolutely under his command. And because of this, slowly people stopped inviting him to that uh, banquets and the uh, parties and all. And because he had never bothered to save for the tomorrow, very soon he came to very bad circumstances. He had nothing to eat, no money at all left. And uh, because of his past uh, style of living, he was very much ashamed to beg for anything. And time passed and he realized that now very few days are left. And at that moment the thought came to him that this talent was given to me by God by my beloved Prophet Muhammad. Yet never in my whole life did I ever entertain him. I spent all my time entertaining human beings, influential people. Never once did I, out of sheer love and gratitude, entertain my beloved. Today I'll go and entertain him. So with his broken down sitar, he goes to a graveyard and there relaxing by the side of a grave. He sang one or two songs, his voice was gone, everything was gone and he tried to entertain his beloved. Here, on the other end, Omar, the second caliph of the Islamic world, about two o'clock in the afternoon, he feels sleepy. And Omar realized immediately that something important must be coming from the other world. So he allowed himself to drift into sleep. And sure enough, in his dream, Prophet Muhammad came and said, go to such and such a graveyard, a very close and dear friend of mine is resting there. First go to the royal treasury, take out 1,000 pieces of golden dinar and offer it to my friend, my very dear friend. So he went to the treasury, collected the money and went to the graveyard. He looked all around, there was no one there except this very old man and a broken sitar lying by his side with his head on a grave fast asleep. When he made sure that there is no one else but him, he realized this is the beloved of God went very quietly sat by his side, not to disturb him. And when he woke up, that man was frightened because he says the caliph of the Islamic world and in Islam music is not that much welcomed. Moreover, this happened in a graveyard. So he began to ask uh, Omar his forgiveness. And Omar said to him, relax, first listen to what I have to tell you. And he narrated to him what had happened. How in the dream, Muhammad told him, that a very dear friend of mine is resting in the grave, offering 1,000 golden dinars because he has entertained me too. And this man with tears flowing down his eyes, for oh, one day I entertained my beloved and this is the response he gave to me. And he looked at Omar for a while and then he says to him, since I am Muhammad as my friend, I have no need for this gold. And he left the place. So this is the first lesson that we have to learn. That if at all any one of us, and each and every one present here, has some talent or the other, you know, like uh, Amrit has a talent for teasing and making a fool of me. <laughs> <laughs> so let us realize one thing, that the talent comes from no place else except, except him, except him. And, it, and that talent should exclusively be used in the service of our beloved. That is the first lesson we must learn. In, uh, in Egypt, there was a master by, uh, by the name of Zu al -Nur. Zu al means a fisherman. His name was Zu, Zu al -Nur. And his profession was a fisherman. But he was a perfect master. 
and a very young Egyptian coming from a very rich and aristocratic family became his disciple. And uh, he began to serve his master. And all the wealth of his family spent running the ashram. But not once did Zuhal Nun ever thank that young man. And that sort of bothered him and irritated the young man. But he went on. Till one fine day, his entire wealth was over. And the young man now says to himself with great pride, I'll see how they run the ashram now. Up till now I was supporting everything. Let's see what they do now about it. So that night, uh, Zuhal Nun called him to his room, that young man. And he said, sit down there. He sat down. <coughs> and uh, in Egypt, So, in Egypt, River Nile, they have a white clay, and they make pots and pans of this white clay. And uh, believe me, they are so very beautiful, if you put water inside, it becomes really ice cold. For me. I brought one pot on my ship one time, it's broken now, but it's a very beautiful one. Anyway, there was a heap of that clay lying in the corner and Zuhal Nun told him, bring me a fistful of that clay. So he brought that clay along and Zuhal Nun chit-chatting with him casually began to press that clay like this and this. And within no time at all it turned into a ruby the size of a duck's egg. Very precious and very beautiful. And Zuhal Nun told him, tomorrow morning go to the jewelers all over Egypt, Cairo, and find out the value of this uh, ruby. Don't sell it, just find out the value. So he went to the jewelers and found out. And the value that was given to him was exactly the amount he had spent all these years in the service of God. <laughs> then he came back. And Zuhal Nun said to him, Yeah, what did you find out? Well, Master, it's worth so and so. And how much did you spend on Ashram for all these years? Mm -hmm. Nearly the same amount. Then Zuhal Nun gave orders, smashed that ruby to pieces. It was destroyed. And then he made him sit near him and he said to him, You fool, do you realize what would have happened if I even once told you thank you? If I had said thank you even once, you would have had the entire reward of all your service in this world. I did not want that to happen. You should have your reward in the world to come. You, uh, you didn't come here to hear from me every two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Did you? You came here to serve the Lord. Now serve Him properly. And remember, this ashram was never dependent on your ancestors' property or your wealth. I can run my own ashram. And beloved Baba said the same thing. I alone do my own work. But He gives us an opportunity to serve Him. And that is where God and God alone is the only karma yogi. We human beings can never be karma yogi. I fancy myself to be a dog lover and I had a very nice experience of my own. I stay in Pune. Originally I am from Pune in a very small house with a small opening, sort of a yard over there. And stray dogs come and go. And I had a habit of feeding all of them that time. And one day as the stray dog was eating, she was a female. I said, you know, suddenly, I'm a great dog lover. <laughs> How lovingly and how comfortably they are in my presence, enjoying that day. And suddenly I realized that this is wrong. The vessel is Baba. The food inside is Baba. The one eating that food is it Baba. Then who the hell am I to take credit for it? And yet, here lies the beauty of our beloved. With all that, he steps out of the picture and permits a ship back by the name of Sam Kerala <laughs> to take all the credit from us. And that is the first requirement of uh, Karma Yoga, that the thought of self should never be done. And that is why I always feel that except for our beloved, there is no one who can be a true Karma Yoga, unless he has advanced very much on the path. So that is another thing we have to learn, that he alone does his own work. Whatever little service we render, is nothing else but an opportunity that He grants us to serve Him, no more. So the credit should never be asked. As a matter of fact, let us jump to the fifth uh, teaching by Bayezid of Islam, which is appropriate at this moment. Bayezid of Islam was a perfect master of his time and was the Qutub Irshad, 
Kutub Irshad is the highest of the five masters. He is the one who is heard and heeded. And according to what beloved Baba has given us the hints, Sai Baba of Shirdi was the Kutub Irshad of this time. Mm. And he is also known as the Sahib Avant. That means his authority is there only till, till his living presence. Mir Baba, Muhammad, Christ and all, they are known as Sahib Zaman. Their authority is there all the time. No matter how and when we cry out to him, he will answer them. So, Bayezid of Bistana said, when I inquired about sin, love answered, love answered, your very existence is a sin beyond compare. So why talk about minor sin? And this is exactly what we all do over here. Every one of us. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm talking about myself. We are there at the Samadhi. We are in the presence of the Lord. We know He's the master of the uh, three universes and all the 21 Brahmans that are attached to it. And with all that, even if, as I'm praying, I'm saying to myself, Beloved Baba, you are there, of course, I don't deny it. But Sam Keravala too is there. <laughs> <laughs> and therein lies the big, the big problem. Yeah. Your very existence is a sin beyond compare. But that, that existence cannot be right out on my own. He and he alone can do it. So that is the third lesson that we have to learn. That uh, this should not be the case. One of the basic requirements of the path is that we should keep away from this world. And uh, there was an Arab by the name of Sari Sakti. He was a jeweler by profession and very, very rich man. <laughs> Sari Sakti had a slave, a Negro slave, who served him very loving and religious. Anyway, so Sari Sakti would regularly give parties, being a very rich man. <coughs> so one day, one of his friends told Sari Sakti, Sari, that slave of yours, that Negro, he's a bloody swine, he's a Mahapa. I've seen him many times in the graveyard, digging up graves and stealing items from the dead bodies. Now this is something which is sacrilegious, you can't do that. But Sari Sakti was a very sensible man. He heard the thing and then he decided, I'll find out for myself what goes on. So next, next uh, night he followed him. And sure enough, he went to the graveyard, that slave. And there he entered the whole bedroom which was there. And the whole night through he began to pray to God. And his master was observing all this. Early morning, the man came out of the pit, small hole, and went straight to the masjid of morning prayers. And unknown to him, his master was following him. The morning prayers were over and the congregation left. And the slave was the only one left in the mosque, masjid. He raised his hands to Allah and said, All I want to do in my life is to love and remember you. But unfortunately, you have made me a slave of a human being. And as such, I have to serve him also. And that is why I cannot devote all my time to you. If you can kindly help me buy my freedom, then I can devote all my time to you. As he was offering a prayer, a ray of light descended from the roof of the masjid. And when it touched his palm, it turned into a golden dinar. Sari Sakti was observing all this. Now the man is coming out of the masjid and his master caught his hand. And he says, I've seen everything today. And the Negro says, yes. And his master said, as of today the tables are turned. You are my master and I am your slave. And the slave said, Master, all I want to do is keep loving my beloved. If you set me free, that is all I want. And his master said, as of today you are free. But tell me, how you have managed to advance so high on the path? Teach me about the path. Because no one can traverse this path unless and until a guide is there to help us. And the slave gave him three advices which are very, very applicable to each one of us. And the first advice he gave to his master was, keep this world aside. And having done so, never turn around to give it a second look. 
That was the first advice he gave. Second advice he gave was, avoid human company. Make your beloved your one and only companion. I mean, if that's the case, I should be leaving. Yeah? Well, what I was <laughs> saying, Sam, we better get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> Oops, too bad, Sam. Sorry, we gotta go. <laughs> so, so, uh, make Allah your only companion. And the third is a, a general weakness, especially mine. Eat, drink, and sleep in moderation, so that, the, <laughs> so that the three do not become a barrier between you and your beloved. So this is another advice that we have to learn. That if you want to traverse the path, the only way to do is to turn our face away from the world. Again and again we must repeat to ourselves this one thing. Nothing can be done unless and until He wills it. Mm -hmm. And that is why an Urdu poet has said, Rahe ulfat tai karu apni taraf se meri kya mazal, to jahan tak le chale bas chala jata hoon ga. That I traverse the path of love on my own, what bloody shit on my part. Absolute craziness. Free translation? Huh? You can't do it. It's literal. I can only traverse that much distance where you take my hand and take me across and no place else. Beloved Baba asks us, in the past, we would go to monasteries and ashrams and mountaintops for a full enlightenment. But at least the way I understand, Baba wants us to stay in the world, and at this time, in our, this time, we're going for enlightenment by staying in the world, not removing ourselves. No, no, mind you. When they say that, uh, you know, kick the world aside, they don't mean that you smear your body with ashes and run straight to the Himalayas. No. Be in the world, do everything, and yet be away from the world. And again, as I said, it is done only through that. How do you do it? I don't know, I'm burnt. Maybe Sam will enlighten us. I told you, he and alone, he alone. Exactly, it's his will, we're waiting for his will. And everything happens at the right time, the right moment, and by his grace. There was a very young child, about six years old, and one morning, standing on the gallery of a palace. Very, she was a daughter of a princely uh, family. And a marriage procession was going by. And the child was leaning across from the balcony and called the mother and said, Mother, what is this? And the mother said, it's a wedding procession. A bride is being taken to her husband's house. And the child asked the mother, does every girl have a husband? And the mother said, yes, of course. And uh, then who is my husband? The mother was busy with her, with her household chores. So just to keep the child's petal shut, she answered, your husband is not Krishna. The right time, and the right words, and the message reached the heart of that child. And now Krishna became her husband. Her whole life was devoted to him. And then later on, no? so, so go ahead. And then later on, you know, she left the palatial life, she left everything. Mm. She became a sannyasa in life. Mm. Mirabai, yes. Mirabai. And this woman, she would compose bhajans of her own and she would put them to music on her own and dance to the music of her own bhajans. Never did she weigh much more than about 98 to 100 pounds, very thin and low. But every time this woman danced, so great was the power and efficacy of the divine love that the whole of creation danced through that. That was Mira. Today we worship her as the great saint of India. This is love. And again, all this happens by the grace of God, the right time and the right place. Without that, you cannot do anything. There was a man in Andalusia, Spain, by the name of Jaffa. And Jaffa was a spiritually inclined man. And uh, he decided that uh, in order to traverse the path, one must always have a master to guide him. And he realized that normally spiritual masters are found only in the Oriental. As a matter of fact, Swami Vivekananda also has pointed that out to us. That if an Oriental wants to learn about science and technology, he must sit at the feet of the Occidental. But if an Occidental wants to learn about God, he must sit at the feet of an Oriental. But that Oriental should be a real one. I mean, no half big potato. Otherwise, beloved, 
but <laughs> we live in Baba the beautiful jetty for such half baked potatoes. If you follow them, you'll be left to a living neither in this world nor in that. <laughs> <laughs> you said you will last. Uh, Say it again, you want to keep snowing. In between, no, but it's always half baked potatoes. This will be like a Baba's jetty. Thank you. <laughs> so he went all the way to Baghdad because at that time Baghdad was the central place for Islamic learning and philosophy. And there in the marketplace he came across a green one. He's known as the green one because normally he's always dressed in green clothes, shimmering, shining clothes. And he's known as Kizer, the invisible guide. The Jews worship him as Elijah. And the Hindus worship him as the Dattatre, the invisible guide, yes. It was the Dattatre, the invisible guide, who gave knowledge to Nivrutti, the elder brother of Ryaneshwar, the perfect master of Maharashtra. And Nivrutti in turn enlightened his younger brother Ryaneshwar. And we have the uh, now Panthis, a, a, a series of time masters, the head of the blind, he got his enlightenment uh, through Machindranath. Machindranath got his enlightenment through that invisible guide. So he met this invisible guide, Eli. Uh, in Sufism, is known as Kizar. And uh, the green man asked him, Jaffa, what are you doing here? And Jaffa was a little surprised that he knows me. Then he told him that I'm looking for a master. And the green man said, there are two things that are wrong in your search. One is the place. You have come all the way from Europe to the east in search of your master. But your master is right in your doorstep under the chair. Go back to that place and inquire about one Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi from the tribe of Cairo. He is the one. He is going to be the greatest master of this people. Approach him. So Jafar left and came back to his hometown and made inquiries about this man, Muhyiddin uh, Ibn Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi. And he was guided to a school. And he thought that he must be a teacher then. So when the school dispersed, he began to inquire who is Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi from the tribe of Tai. And they pointed out a child about six, seven years old with Quran under his arm. And he approached him and he said, uh, Are you Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi from the tribe of Tai? And he said, Yes. And because the green man had already told him that he's going to be the great master of the age, so he asked him, Are you the greatest master of this age? And the child said, I need time to answer that question and walked away. So Jafar told him as he was walking away, I have no need for you. And he left. Thirty years later, if Mohdin had Nairaim, if Arabi has now started holding his own court. And having wandered all over in search of the master, Jafar eventually comes back to his barn. And when he entered the hall, Mangli hall, Mohdin ibn Arabi tells him, Well, Jafar, you still don't have any need of me. <laughs> and he quietly sat down. And then he reminded him, Remember the green one? He told you that the two things that were wrong in your search. One was the place. You went to uh, east, whereas I was here in the west. And the other was time. Thirty years had to elapse before you could really surrender to your master for your further advancement on the path. Surprisingly enough, uh, many masters seem to have their head disciple by the name of Jaffa. And this reminds me of a very funny, humorous story by uh, Mullah Nasaruddin. <laughs> and Jafar became his head disciple. And once the people asked Jafar about his master, and Jafar told them that I came in search of truth over here. All I found was blandness. But had I searched for truth any place else, I would have never found it. That was his master. Now Jafar, when he entered the ashram, he had this one very bad habit of borrowing things from the other Ashramites and never returning back. <laughs> so, the other inmates complained to the master that this is his behavior. You better drive him out of the ashram. He's not fit for this place. 
and Nasruddin uh, said, don't worry, I'll cure him of the habit. Sometime later Nasruddin calls Jafar and he says to him, today I have to go to visit some very important government officials and I want you to accompany me. And Jafar said, I would love to do so, Master, but I don't have a decent rope to wear. And uh, Mullah Nasruddin said, I got one very good one to spare, you wear that. So both of them went, they visited the first government official, meeting was over and uh, Mullah Nasruddin introduced the disciple to that official and said, hey, is Jafar my disciple? But the rope that he's wearing is fine. <laughs> Very much put to bed. So when he came out, he said, Master, please don't do that. <laughs> I felt very embarrassed. So Master said, I'm sorry, Jaffa, I won't do it again. So the next visit, they go to another official, everything is over. And the Master very politely says, my disciple Jaffa, uh, but the robe is that is not his own. <laughs> then the third place he went, it's the same thing. And then he says, my disciple Jaffa, ah, but Jaffa, you reminded me not to talk about the robe, so I won't say anything more. <laughs> and then suddenly Jaffa realized that Master is hinting at something. And when they were returning back, he said, from now on, let's make sure if you take anything from anyone, return it back to them. This is how we talk in the right place. Right. These are the things that we learn by surrendering to our beloved. And our beloved, his method of teaching also was wonderful. And one of the best incidences that I have ever heard from Brother Eraj is the one about uh, Eraj having, uh, one day Eraj was telling Baba about some lover of beloved Baba, that Baba, this man's external behavior is totally uh, different to what he's showing himself to be in your presence. Something, some remark like that, which was not uh, appropriate, a bit on the derogatory side. But Lord never criticizes anyone. He accepts us totally with all our faults, weaknesses, everything. So Baba says to Eraj, look, Baba raised his left hand, sitting in that same chair in the Mandli hall. And uh, Baba told Eraj, what do you see, Eraj? And Eraj said, uh, you have raised your left hand. Do you see any, anything else? And he said, yes, I can see the shadow of your left hand on the wall. And beloved Baba said, Eraj, you see the shadow. I know the reality. And this is God. I love that. Yes. And another occasion, beloved Baba used to say, why have, I given, why have I given you two years? So that something enters from one year and you throw it from the other. <laughs> especially, uh, especially, something, uh, you know, uh, something like backbiting or things like that. And then, uh, each master has his own stuff. Oh, yeah, I thought it would be at least five, ten. No, no, but I'm living at five twenty, five thirty. I'm a busy man. <laughs> oh, shouldn't we take care of take Each one has his own way of teaching us. Out. And uh, and accordingly, the selection also is made in the same manner. Sounds very easy and casual, but there is a, a, a definite madness, a uh, method in the madness. Three people approached, uh, I think it was Abu Sa'id or some man, Sufi master with the request that uh, they be accepted as disciples. I think it was Abu Sa'id only, because Abu Sa'id had a very sarcastic tongue also. <laughs> so Abu Sa'id says to his close disciple, put all the three of them in individual rooms and make sure they do not see each other before the interview or after the interview. And uh, they were taken to three rooms, they were made comfortable, 
and turn by turn they were called before the master. And after a casual chit chat and making them feel comfortable, Abu Said asked this man the question, Supposing you come across a purse loaded with money and you know the, to whom this purse belongs to, would you return it back to the owner? And the man said, of course I would. And Abu Said told him, you are a bloody fool. And the man was shocked that this man tells me to steal the purse. <laughs> Thank God I realized that he is a hoax. And with great disgust he left the presence of the master. The second man was called again. Casual chit chat, the same like our beloved, who could make you feel comfortable within a second's time. And the same question was put to the second one. Supposing you come across a purse loaded with money, and you know to whom it belongs to, would you return it back? And the man was something like. So he said, Do you think me to be a fool? Of course I'll keep it for myself. <laughs> and the master smiled and said, you are lost not only in this world, but in the world to come. You can go. And the third one came, and the same question was put to him. And he said to the Master, If at that time, by the grace and compassion of the Lord, good will and good intention prevails, I will return the purse. If at that moment Satan takes over, then I might be tempted to keep the purse. And Abu Said said, Take him inside. He is our new disciple. These are the ways in which we select the design. <coughs> and uh, their one concern is always to uh, help you, not only of this world but the next. As Muhammad has once said, if you can make uh, loving Allah your one and only care, Allah shall take care of all your cares in this world and the next. And since I am very close and dear to Allah, Try and love me more and more. There was a certain king and he was suffering from uh, some very peculiar sort of a disease. And all the doctors of that time suggested that he should have the flesh of a young child properly cooked and all. Uh, so naturally a proclamation was made that such and such a child is needed for the health of the king. Certain parents were very poor and they had a child that age, so they sold that child. The Qazi, the head of the justice department, made a proclamation that uh, since it is the question of the king's health, a sacrifice of the child is legal and lawful. And the executioner was of course ready to do so because he would get five golden pieces for the child. As the child was led to the scaffold, the child began to smile and the king asked him, why are you smiling? And he said, for the first time the law of the universe has changed. Parents are supposed to take care of their child. My parents sold me. The Kazi is supposed to uphold the law of the realm. He conveniently bypasses that authority and says it is lawful for the king to slaughter a subject. The purpose of the king is that he should take care of his subjects, not this ill treat them. And here is a king who is willing to slaughter an innocent child for the sake of his own hand. That is why I smile. Because now, the only uh, darbar, the only court where I can make an appeal to is the court of my beloved. And the king realized his mistake. And he said, no more danger. And then he realized the reason why the master had put him to this test was to find out deep within him what is the reality. And eventually, by his own grace or something, the king did get cured by the, of the problem. Uh, such uh, great ones, they show the tendency of the coming greatness, even as a child. And, uh, Baha'is of the Bistan, the same one who taught us, Lao answered, your very existence is a sin beyond compare. As a young child he would attend school to study the Quran. And one day the teacher declared to the class that in the year so and so I went on a pilgrimage to Mecca and I put entire trust of mine to Allah and I had only two dirhams in my pocket. Two dirhams like today's value would be less than five cents American money. 
So he said, I put my trust in Allah and had only two dirhams in my pocket. Now as it was a once to become the master of that time, he stood up and says to the, his teacher, Teacher, you said that uh, you went on pilgrimage in such and such a year, yes. And you said that you put your trust in Allah, said, yes. Then Master answered my question, what were those two dirhams doing in your pocket? <laughs> and the Master realized that this child is going to be something great. And it, uh, they accepted his fault. Similarly, a cook in a certain ashram approached the Master. And he said to him, Master, supposing a child is destined to be a great uh, spiritual leader or a master, does that child exhibit its greatness uh, even as a child? Oh, yes, of course he does. And as a matter of fact, you are very lucky because a village grows by, a young child passes by our ashram each morning, going to the market to buy things. Tomorrow morning when the child passes by, you stop him and ask him this question, where are you going? So the cook next morning waited for the child to come back and he saw the child coming, you know, typical running here and there, behaving just like an innocent child, but destined to be a master who is old boy, not boy. And he approached the child and said, where are you going? And the child says, wherever my two feet carry me. <laughs> now the cook didn't understand what he was trying to convey. He went to his master and said, this is what he told me. And the master said, you fool, all you had to do was ask him, where would you have gone if you had no fit to carry you? Mm -hmm. That was all you had to do. Oh. <laughs> so next morning he waited again. And he said, where are you going? And he says, wherever the winds carry me. Oh. Again he was stunned. <laughs> I went to the master, this is what he said to me. You fool, I taught you yesterday itself. All you had to do was ask him, where would you go if the winds were not there to carry you? Tomorrow I'll catch him first. <laughs> so next morning, the child is approaching and the cook approached him and said, Hey, where are you going? And the child smiled and said, I'm going to the market to buy vegetables. This story was narrated to us by Sister Mani in the Mandi Hall. In the early years, uh, the disciples of the beloved Baba's ashram up the hill, there were nearly, I think, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 or slightly more number of ladies who had devoted their whole life at his lotus feet. And they were new to this uh, way of living, and each one was struggling hard like a racehorse as to who goes ahead of the other. And beloved Baba was fully aware of this situation. So one day he calls uh, Mani, his sister. And look at the beauty of our beloved, let me digress a bit. His sister Mani was a very small child and she wanted a tricycle. She would see other children riding it and she wanted one of her own. And she says to Baba, Get me a tricycle next birthday. And Baba says, I swear on it, I'll give you one. And she says, Give me a promise. And Baba said, I give you a promise. See that hand over there? The small hand. On the life of this hand, I swear I'll get you my tricycle. When the birthday came, no tricycle came. And Mani was very upset and she cried with her Baba and said, Where is the tricycle? Mama said, believe me, I was going to buy one for you. But before I could fulfill my promise, the hand died. Oh, 
<laughs> and on more serious way, these are the ways that how our beloved teaches us. I mean, it would be it would be useless to say that we are a lump of clay. Let us face the fact: we are a lump of shit. That is all. <laughs> no, 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 no question of laughing. This is exactly what we are. What, what, yeah, only that means. Wait, what happened to Mani? No, 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 she, no, she was satisfied. She, she was completely it. okay with she that answer. She was, she was, she was, she was, she was that the hand died. Fine, that's yeah. absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. If the hand died, didn't break his promise. The hand died. So, How old was she? Must be about okay. seven, eight years old seven, at the time. <laughs> and uh, this one was uh, told to me by my cousin Nairman Jassawala, Erich's younger brother, who spent uh, nearly an, his entire life with the Lord Baba. And uh, when it comes to teaching someone. The Lord will not even let go his own mother. 1939, beloved Baba is in Bangalore, and a very rich man from that place had offered a vast uh, piece of land to beloved Baba, which today is known as Baira Mangla, and where they have established the universal. Uh, Sorry, who offered it? Well, I don't know. Okay, that. you don't know. I don't know. But some uh, gentleman from Bangalore, Achha. who was a multi-millionaire and owned that land. Okay. So Baba decided that we shall use this land as a, a place for its uh, universal spiritual center. And a day was fixed for Bhumi Pujan. Bhumi Pujan means the breaking the can offer in prayers that the project moves smoothly and freely and quickly. And naturally, Baba told all the ashram and ladies, "Be ready at 10 o'clock in the morning to go there." Beloved Baba's mother, Shirin, was there, and uh, about quarter to ten or so, Baba came to her to his mother's room, and Shirin was dressed in a very beautiful sari. And Baba says to her, "His mother, mother, it's time to depart, and you are not dressed." And mother is just you know snapped at him and said, "Can't you see? I'm wearing my good sari and all." And Baba said, "Don't tell me you're going to wear this sari for the occasion." Why not? It's an important occasion, mm. and then God comes out with the reality. Mm. Mother, you happen to be a mother of a fakir. A mother of a fakir should be dressed accordingly. Mm. A mother of a fakir with such a rich sari on her is not an appropriate thing to do. A mother of a fakir should be wearing something very simple and appropriate for the occasion. You are a mother of a fakir, not some ordinary mother. And then he says, "Look at my jacket." And it, it was an old jacket with three or four patches everywhere. I'm wearing this. And Shirin said, "Go and change it, Naro. You have got good jackets. Put on a new one." <laughs> and Baba said, "No. This is the right dress for a fakir. This is how we should be dressed. Kindly change that sari." His mother was in tears, but still Baba insisted that she should wear a very simple sari. And he made her a plain white simple uh, emblem sari. He is the very ocean of love and compassion and mercy. Imagine the pain that must have been there in his heart to see his own mother in tears. But he accepted that rather that than his mother get entrapped in the nets of Maya. This is the way he teaches us how to live. So I think that should be the end of it. Thank you, sir.